in terms of Libertarian Alliance. And, uh, uh, that Liv is going to give us a talk on, uh, in defense of Mises' is a priori. Um, and uh, is that, uh, are you ready, Deathliff? Okay. I'm going to hand it over to Deathliff. Cheers. Okay. Great. Thank you very much, David. <clears throat> so uh, the, the title of my talk tonight is uh, Economics and the a priori in defense of Ludwig von Mises. So this is really a talk on uh, the method of economics. Uh, it will deal with such questions uh, as uh, what type of science is economics, uh, what phenomena does economics deal with, and uh, how do we arrive at economic theories? How do we discover and formulate the laws of economics? Uh, what do we do when we think as economists? And the position I take on these questions is that of the great Austrian economist Ludwig von Mises. And Ludwig von Mises argued that economics was an a priori science, and that when an economist thinks as an economist and tries to discover the laws of economics, he uses the a priori method. Uh, that makes economics fundamentally different from any of the natural scientists, uh, sciences which use the a posteriori method. Now, I will explain these terms in a minute, but uh, I'd already like to stress that Mises was very much in the minority with that view among economists. Um, he first published a collection of essays on the topic in 1933, uh, so 80 years ago. And uh, over those 80 years, most economists agreed with him, uh, disagreed with him, and I would say that probably the disagreement is even more pronounced today, the way that modern economics has developed, it has developed in a direction that makes it very much appear as if it was a natural science and thus an a posteriori science rather than a priori science. But not only economists, I think also many sort of social you know, and political philosophers disagreed with, uh, with von Mises, and that includes even some libertarian philosophers. Uh, people who usually have a keen interest in economics and found, find themselves in agreement with von Mises on, on many topics, uh, but often they still uh, disagree with him on the topic of methodology. And that is why I called my talk tonight in defense of Ludwig von Mises. So before I say a few words about why this is uh, important, um, let me just briefly sketch sort of some of the key terms and describe briefly Mises' position. So Mises was saying that uh, the laws of e economics are derived by, first of all, understanding the purpose of human action. So uh, uh, human action is different from any other phenomenon we see in the natural world and the world around us because it's driven by purposeful behavior. And the starting point of any human action is uh, the act of valuation. And again, this is a, an entirely unique phenomenon in the world. Uh, human beings value, they uh, value things differently, and they uh, purposefully interfere in their environment to shape it in some ways and make it more suitable to them. And that is sort of purposeful human behavior. That's the starting point. And if we understand the purpose behind that action, we can derive certain regularities, certain patterns that must, be, that must surface or that must uh, determine human action and human social interaction, and that is what economics does. And uh, in describing that process, Mises was saying that this, this process makes economics an a priori science. Now, a priori means a priori knowledge or justification is independent of experience. Uh, the opposite of that is a posteriori knowledge or justification which is dependent on experience or empirical evidence. So a priori, from the Latin sort of the earlier, is knowledge that I have before I even have experience. Where a posteriori knowledge is knowledge that is derived from experience and is subject to empirical testing. Now Mises further, further says that experience tells us something we do not know before and could not learn but for having had the experience. But the characteristic feature of a priori knowledge is that we cannot think of the truth of its negation or of something that would be at variance with it. If we qualify a concept as a priori, we want to say first that the negation of what it asserts is unthinkable for the human mind and appears to it as nonsense. Secondly, 
that this a priori concept or proposition is necessarily implied in our mental approach to all the problems concerned, that is, in our thinking and acting concerning these problems. Now, this sounds fairly abstract, but if you look at a couple of examples, it may become clearer. Uh, if I say that uh, the, uh, the, the eggs of the black widow spider take 39 days to hatch, you would clearly identify this as an a posteriori, posteriori uh, uh, knowledge. It's, it's a classical statement of natural sciences. Nobody could make that statement without anybody having had the experience of observing the black widow spider. And if you want to falsify or test that statement, we would have to go out and observe those spiders ourselves. That is a, a classical statement of the natural sciences. And most people, if people think about science or the, any organized body of knowledge, people usually think about the natural sciences. And that is very clear to us. So this is certainly uh, meets the, the, uh, the, uh, the a posteriori requirement. Experience tells us something that we did not know before and could not learn but for having had the experience. But if I look at something like mathematics, for example, which is a clear example of a priori knowledge, yeah, if you grasp the concept of counting and understand what one, two, three, and four means and have a grasp of the concept of addition, you will see that one plus one equals two and that two plus two equals four. This is a priori knowledge. This is not subject to testing. Indeed, the idea that you would have to go out in the world and constantly test this you know, statement would be absurd to us. You know, it, it, it is. It is knowledge that we have before we have experience. The char characteristic feature of a priori knowledge is that we cannot think of the truth of its negation or something that would be at variance with it. If I were to tell you that yesterday I experienced that 2 plus 2 equals 5, you would tell me that I tell you nonsense. If I were to tell you that yesterday I saw a black widow spider where the X had a 40-day hatching period, you know, that would be entirely conceivable. It may still be wrong and subject to testing, but it's a, it's, a, it's a conceivable proposition. Now, here we already realize one of the problems when people talk about the a priori, because many people immediately think that this is tautological. It doesn't tell us anything new. It's just a rearrangement of words. Um, and sometimes people would even argue that it's trivial. Well, maybe it becomes a bit more interesting if you look at other examples of what I consider to be a priori concepts, uh, where it's not so trivial and not so straightforward. If I roll a dice uh, and I were to ask you what is the probability of any given number coming up on top of the dice, you would probably tell me that it's a uh, probability of one sixth. And again, that is knowledge that is inherent in the concept of the dice and of probability. Once you've grasped these mental concepts, any other statement that I would make would appear as nonsense to you. If we qualify a concept as a priori, we want to say first that the negation of what it asserts is unthinkable for the human mind, and secondly, that uh, this a priori concept or proposition is necessarily implied in our mental approach to all problems concerned. So if I complicate my problem and say now I throw two dice and I uh, uh, want to know if the probability that the sum of the two dice comes out to be seven or comes out to be eight and I want to ask you which is more probable, uh, well, if you think about that for a while, you will figure out that it's more probable that the seven comes out than the eight. The uh, probability of two dice coming out with a seven is 17%. The probability of two dice coming out with an eight is 14%. But again, you would not have to throw a single dice, and you would tell me it would be entirely nonsense if I required you to spend the whole night throwing dice uh, to confirm this or test this you know, continuously. It is entirely in incorporated in the entire uh, process of probability and of the concept of the dice. Once you've understood and grasped these concepts, you can work out the solution in a way yourself without any testing. This is not subject to uh, empirical testing. I, I just make, use these examples to show that a priori knowledge is quite common in our life and in our world. I mean, obviously, most of mathematics and logic would fall under a priori concept. It doesn't mean it's trivial. It doesn't mean it's uh, meaningless. It doesn't mean it cannot be critiqued. Of course, if, you, if any of you wanted to challenge me on these statements, we could have a, maybe an interesting discussion about this. Uh, but the, the critique is not based on empirical evidence or empirical testing. Now, it, Mises made the statement that economics is exactly something very s similar, not identical, but very similar to mathematics or logic. Uh, Economics is not an empirical science, 
the natural sciences or empirical sciences, and the key laws of economics are not arrived at empirically or by observation or empirical testing, and that cannot be refuted by empirical testing. They are outside of any experience of the external world. And Mises did not say that uh, scientists, that economists should use this method. It wasn't a recommendation. He said that economists, when they really properly work as economists, always use and have, always have used that method. That is the method of economics. It's not it should be the method. It is the method of economics. And all great laws of economics are, at, at, at the heart, a priori statements. Now, let me give you some examples. I mean, uh, if, you, if you take, uh, let's say, um, one of the greatest discoveries in the history of economics, which is probably uh, David Ricardo's law of comparative cost, which has since been expanded into what we can call the law of association, which tells us that uh, if a group of people work together, they benefit from the division of labor, as we've known for a long time, and that this benefit, everybody, every single member of the community benefits from this. And this is even the case for if one of the members is less skilled or less productive or less uh, uh, yeah, able to perform any of the given tasks. So if someone's productivity is lower than that of any other member in every single respect in the group, it would still make sense for those people to cooperate. That can be derived from Ricardo's law of comparative cost. It does apply to any form of human cooperation. It is just like rolling the dice and the probability laws inherent in any concept of human cooperation, because the concept of marginal productivity is inherent in human cooperation or in human activity and human productive human action. And therefore, David Ricardo's law of association is inherent in it. It's not trivial, because obviously, you know, it, it, took, it took Ricardo to discover it. Um, and it is very powerful in its implications. Uh, for example, it is a, is a key argument against any form of trade barrier. The idea that uh, any nation would have to be shielded by trade barriers and tariffs because it is just less productive in any way than, than all its trading partners and therefore would be taken advantage of, as, as some people believe, Ricardo's law can show that this is indeed nonsense. It's an a priori statement. It's not, it doesn't require empirical testing. It, we cannot really even conceive of it not being true in any form of human cooperation. I'll give you another example from my own book. Um, and again, I, I argue in my book, Paper Money Collapse, uh, there are a few chapters on uh, monetary theory. Now, I did not discover this. Uh, <laughs> other economists uh, have. But I, um, there is a chapter in there where I explain uh, something like the demand for money. And it can be shown that if a society uses a medium of exchange, if a society engages in indirect exchange, so uses money as a facilitator of tra trade, and the, the society has a certain demand for money. And now if the demand for money rises, if people, for whatever reason, want to hold higher cash balances, balances, they want to hold more of their wealth in the form of money, that extra demand for money can be met entirely uh, by allowing the people to bid up the price of money, lower the money prices of goods and services, increase the purchasing power of money, and that process will automatically uh, uh, meet the additional money demand. So any changes in money demand can be met by changes in the purchasing power of money. They do not have to be met by physical changes to the supply of the money substance. Now, again, this is inherent in the concept of a medium of exchange. It's entailed in the concept of money. Once you've understood money and why people, we see how, why people hold money, and we all know why people hold money because we are human beings ourselves and we can see the purpose of using money. Once we've understood the purpose behind money and what it does for us, we can, via logical deduction, arrive at this law, and it's inherent in any form of medium of exchange. So if I were to go out and go to a society that nobody has ever had any contact with, I go to a remote island, and there is a very primitive civilization that nobody has ever observed. Now, obviously, I would have to use observation, I would have to use experience, and I would have to use elements of the natural sciences to determine whether these people use money. They, they will do things, they will maybe trade or exchange things, and it will take me a while to figure out if what they're doing entails the use of money. And maybe I find out after a while that they use seashells as money. So I, I, again, we need experience to, to determine whether this specific society uses money. But once we've found that out, the laws of money, the laws that we developed 
that relate to money demand and money supply and the purchasing power of money, the key economic laws related to money do apply to that society. And if the, if the supply of seashells stagnates, and but the productivity of the island increases, all that will mean is over time is the purchasing power of every shell will go up. As, as, as a law is inherent in the concept of money and medium of exchange. And it is not subject to empirical testing. It is part of that mental approach. That is in a nutshell what sort of Mises asserted economics was and, and how economics is conducted. And Mises was not the only and not the first economist to make that statement. Uh, Nassau Williams Sr. was one of the economists who had very similar ideas. John Stuart Mill even, although his approach was very different in many ways, uh, had certain ideas that were similar to Mises's. Uh, the economist who was probably closest to Mises was John Eliot Cairns, uh, a British classical economist from Ireland, uh, whose idea, who wrote a book on methodology, which was, had some ideas that were very similar. Friedrich Wieser, who was a, a contemporary of Mises's in Austria, had similar ideas. But even the Chicago economist Frank Knight, who was a major economist in the early part of the 20th century in the United States, uh, had ideas that were similar in terms of methodology to those uh, of Mises. But maybe nobody was as consistent in arguing for the a priori method. And most economists actually remained hostile. In fact, uh, to take just a few examples, Paul Samuelson, who wrote a classic textbook on macroeconomics and was for many years, if you like, sort of the high priest of modern Keynesianism in the United States, he wrote in 1964, in connection with the exaggerated claims that used to be made in economics for the power of deduction and a priori reasoning by classical writers, by Karl Menger, by the 1932 Lionel Robbins, by disciples of Frank Knight, by Ludwig von Mises, I tremble for the reputation of my subject. Fortunately, we have left that behind us. And Mark Blauch, who was a British uh, uh, economist, um, wrote in the 1980s, he wrote a book on methodology, and he even said that Mises' later writings on the foundations of economic science are so cranky and idiosyncratic that we can only wonder that they have been taken seriously by anyone. And uh, as I said before, it's, so most economists maintain that economics was an empirical science, and that when we look at economic phenomena, we have to study them as we would uh, study the migration of birds or other sort of social, uh, natural phenomena. Now, surprisingly, I think surprisingly, because many of these other economists obviously were uh, not, not in agreement with lots of Mises' positions, but as I said, some even of libertarian philosophers find it hard to agree with Mises' methodology. One example is David Ramsey Steele, who I think is a, a founding member of the Libertarian so Alliance. Is. Yeah. And uh, it's very interesting. He wrote a very good book uh, called From Marx to Mises. Uh, he wrote it in 1992, which is an excellent book. And it's a, it's a, a book about Mises, one of Mises' greatest contribution to economics, uh, mainly Mises' argument that socialism uh, is conceptually uh, unfeasible. It's impossible to construct a socialist uh, society because socialism cannot calculate, and uh, therefore there are no market prices and no rational economic calculation. By the way, an argument that he made very much on the a priori, um, it's interesting that that was an argument that it was very powerful and it, it was debated among socialists and Marxists, well, first of all in the 1920s and 30s, but actually up to the 1980s, it had a huge influence among socialist uh, economists. Um, uh, David Ramsey Steele agreed with uh, Mises in the book, by and large, but still could not uh, agree with them on methodology. And there's a chapter in the book where he practically disagrees with Mises. Uh, I, I recently, uh, David Ramsey Steele engaged in a, in a, in a debate with a, with a Misesian on YouTube. You can see that on YouTube is uh, Robert Taylor and David Ramsey Steele uh, discussing praxeology. Uh, and I found that in that uh, uh, debate, uh, Steele makes even more critical remarks uh, on a priorism than he makes in his book. It's interesting because I think uh, David Ramsey Steele himself used to be a Marxist. That's right. Certainly was. Yeah. Anyway, certainly was. And uh, was converted to libertarianism by reading Mises' work. So it, it, I think it's remarkable that, that obviously even uh, uh, economists who, or social thinkers were hugely influenced by von Mises, struggled with the a priori concept. Uh, and I think on the LA website, there is a, there's a piece by Old Hickory's Best Books of All Time. I wonder who that is. Uh -huh. uh, an intense place is Mises' Human Action, uh, a deserved place on the, on the list of 50 best books of all time. Human Action is Ludwig von Mises' 
Magnum Opus written in 1949. And there is a comment there that there's plenty of faults here and the a priori claims seem to be as unreal as Spinoza's deductive system, but that hardly ruins this wonderful romp. <laughs> so lots of praise for Mises overall, but again, everybody struggles with the a priori method. So before I, I address some of the critique, uh, first of all, we should say a few things. Why is this important at all? And why is this important for libertarians? Now, Mises started his uh, magnum opus, Human Action, uh, with a sentence, economics is the youngest of all sciences. Now, economics is roughly uh, 300 years old. The first major economists or real modern economists were people like Cantillon, uh, Richard Cantillon, David Hume, and Adam Smith. And then there was a group of uh, outstanding French economists, say, Condorcet and Turgot. Uh, so uh, economics is very much a, uh, an intellectual phenomenon of the 18th century. And it grew from the same intellectual roots that the uh, uh, Enlightenment sprang from. Now, I said the, the Mises' sentence was the economics is the youngest of all sciences. Well, some people may say that um, there were other sciences that are maybe younger, but over the last 300 years, most of those sciences were areas of specialization or subdivisions of sciences that had been around for quite some time. Already the Ancient, uh, ancient Greeks knew sciences such as mathematics, logic, ethics, and physics and biology. But economics was entirely new, and it, 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 it sprang from the discovery that within the sphere of individual human action and hu human social interaction, there are certain regularities, certain patterns that we can observe, uh, and that we can analyze systematically. And this was best observed and first discovered really in the area of market phenomena. So in terms of you know, dealing with money and trade, and production and all these things where people interact to improve them, their, their well-being or their supply with material things. So over the past 300 years that uh, economics has been around as a, as a social science, uh, that was, these 300 years were years of phenomenal change. It was obviously the rise of capitalism, which has completely changed uh, our, our world. It has, it has uh, raised the living standards beyond what anybody would have perceived feasible even 200 years ago. And it has also changed the way we interact and how our societies work and how we think. Now, uh, the e economists did not only describe that process and analyze it, they also actively shaped it. You know, economics, the insights of economists were part of a broader intellectual trend that brought about you know, sort of the, the liberal, classical liberal order of the 19th century and the policy of laissez-faire and, and these, these new ways of looking at social phenomena, which helped to develop capitalism. So the teachings of people like Hume, Smith, Ricardo, and John Stuart Mill had a profound impact on politicians, on statesmen, but or on business people, on, 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 on everybody. And Mises is very clear how much uh, weight he puts on the rise of economics in shaping sort of uh, the, the intellectual world. He, he writes in, in one of his books on methodology, the development of economics and rationalistic so sociology from Cantillon and Hume to Bentham and Ricardo did more to transform human thinking than any other scientific uh, theory before or since. And in human action, there's a phrase where he says, what is commonly called the industrial revolution was an offspring of the ideological revolution brought about by the doctrines of the economists. The economists exploded the old tenets that it is unfair and unjust to outdo a competitor by producing better and cheaper goods, uh, that it is iniquitous to deviate from traditional methods and so forth, and he, he explains this further. These were all attitudes that used to be prevalent in society and that shaped sort of society in the Middle Ages or you know, the, the times of guilds and, and, and very strict customs. So economics was very much part of that uh, uh, broad intellectual trend. Uh, to give you also some examples how that changed politics, John Adams and um, Thomas Jefferson, America's second and third president in, in, the, in the 18th century, spent some time in France and attended the salons in Paris of those French economists I mentioned. Jefferson, in fact, translated a book by Antoine de Stout de Tracy, a, um, a laissez faire economist, French laissez faire economist, into English and edited it and published it after, after he, he uh, le had left the White House. Uh, and that became a, um, that became a, 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 a traditional, a classical, a standard <laughs> textbook of own economics uh, in, in America in the, in the 19th century. And economics was, in a way, uh, uh, as a social scientist, was able to explain you know, 
how a decentralized complex system that is not guided and not directed by a central authority, but just simply by the voluntary contractual interaction of these dispersed individuals, just guided by their own self-interest and by market prices, how that system could operate to the benefit of every single member. So in a way, for a long time, being an economist practically meant being a classical liberal and uh, practically meant being an ad advocate of laissez-faire or being what we would today say a libertarian. But it also meant that those who were critical of the rise of capitalism and the change in society that it uh, facilitated, uh, that those people quickly began to not only attack this new system, but attack e economics itself. So although economics was a very young science and a, and a young intellectual trend, it was immediately bombarded by opposition because it facilitated the rise of capitalism. Now Thomas Carlyle, obviously, you know, the, the social philosopher, the Scottish social philosopher, he called economics a dismal science. There was no, nothing dismal about economics, uh, as I just portrayed it, but Obviously, Carlyle was a, uh, was a fan of hero worship and developed sort of the great man theory and that great leaders would shape society. And it was obviously, uh, yeah, if, if you thought that society could be molded uh, according to the plans of great men, then economics was indeed fairly a, a, a dismal message for you. And obviously, Marx called the economists the sycophants of the bourgeoisie. Uh, so it, all those who were opposed to this new order that capitalism brought about uh, attacked economics as well. So I think if you're charitable, you may say that economists uh, you tried to deviate it from their traditional method and adopted the, natural, the method of the natural sciences because then maybe they felt that they would um, uh, withstand all these pressures and critiques better because the natural sciences were always more um, respected and, and, and nobody really fundamentally criticized the method of the natural sciences. Uh, I think that's a very charitable view. Mises was not so charitable. He actually felt that uh, the people who changed the methods of economics and, and left the sort of the, uh, the, 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 the methods that the great pioneers of economics had used, people like Ricard or people like, like Hume uh, and Mill and Cantillon, that these people, uh, that the people who were going for new methods were doing so because they, they wanted to soften the impact of economics. They wanted to come out with solutions and with laws of economics that would not be, uh, that would be more acceptable for political reasons. And, uh, and it's, it, you can argue, and I think Mises would certainly argue, that the rise of all sorts of state ideologies and interventionism in the 20th century, often advocated or readily approved by various economists, was the, the result of some kind of methodological confusion that had taken hold of economics. So for, for Mises, it was very, very important to be very clear about the method of economics. It was such an important intellectual phenomenon, the rise of modern economics in the 18th and 19th century, that its sort of uh, methodological confusion in the 20th century was a huge uh, political and social uh, problem. I should probably say also a few things about Ludwig von Mises himself. He was born sort of towards the end of that uh, era of laissez-faire and, and um, in classical liberalism. He was born in 1881 in, in what was then Lemberg and is now Lviv in the Ukraine. But he really grew up in Vienna and he became a, a famous um, academic in Vienna, spent most of his life in Vienna, but uh, then in the 19, uh, late 1930s spent some time teaching in Geneva and in the Second World War uh, left uh, Europe for the United States, where he spent the final 33 years of his life, so he died in 1973. Uh, M uh, Mises started out, like many other economists did, as a social democratic reformer, so he uh, uh, wanted to become an economist to, uh, to in a way, to interfe intervene in the economy in a smart way and, and make it better. But the more he learned about economics, the more he became a less affair, an advocate of less affair, mm -hmm. and it has to be said that Ludwig von Mises was probably the most outspoken and most consistent advocate of capitalism and free market economics in the 20th century. Personally, I consider him sort of the outstanding economic genius of the 20th century. His main contributions were in three areas. He became famous by writing a book on money and credit, which he published in 1912. It's called the theory, or been translated as the theory of money and credit, in which he applied the new sort of subjective revolution of the late 18, uh, 18, uh, 19th century, sorry, uh, to uh, money and credit, and where he developed what has later uh, been called the Austrian business cycle theory. Uh, then he wrote a book on uh, socialism, which was the basis of the socialist calculation debate, which I already uh, mentioned, uh, which uh, David Ramsey Steele's book is about. 
Um, and the third contribution was really on epistemology, on the method of economics. Uh, now, it's interesting if you look at the first two subjects here, the theory of money and credit and socialism, these were really hugely important events in the early part of the 20th century. It was practically what we saw, the demise of the classical liberal order coincided with the uh, demise of <laughs> the gold standard and of the idea of gold as, as a form of money that would provide checks to uh, the power of the state. And uh, uh, in this 1912 book, uh, Mises has argued definitely for hard money and for the gold standard and, and, and showed all the problems, again, by a priori analysis that would uh, arrive, uh, result from you know, money printing and from monetary intervention. Uh, the book became even more famous after the 1923 hyperinflation in Germany, and then obviously the, 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 the business cycle problems in the 1930s with the, with the Great Depression. Um, so you, we can see here that sort of what Mises had to say about economics was hugely topical to the time. And uh, the socialism book is probably even more very much a creature of its time. Uh, in the early part of the 20th century, many uh, intellectuals were obviously socialists, but even many economists were socialists. There was a lot of enthusiasm for the project in Russia at the time. And uh, uh, the, the book Socialism that Mises published in 1922, as I said before, was a fundamental challenge to whether uh, a socialist society is even conceptually feasible. And it had a huge impact on any discussion about socialism, even in socialist countries. Um, now, we have to say, looking back, that Mises made these two contributions that were hugely important, and history has, well, if history can prove anything at all, which is questionable, but you know, he should have won these debates and should have gone out, come out as a clear victor. But from the 1930s to today, uh, the way economics is being done and the way economics, economists look at the world has changed so fundamentally that simply because of the way he wrote about economics and he dealt with economic phenomena was perceived as being outdated. And obviously from the 1930s, we had the Keynesian revolution, which, and then the macroeconomic revolution, we had suddenly things like econometrics, where we use mathematical and statistical uh, techniques to analyze economic phenomena. That definitely made economics look much more like the natural sciences. And uh, Mises increasingly, in the area of methodology, looked like a, like a, a creature from the past. And now, it's very interesting that uh, Mises put this huge emphasis on the method of economics. He, as I said before, he thought it was in, it, hugely important and throughout his life, he always came back to it. Uh, as I said, he wrote his first book on epistemology in 1933, and then when he, uh, uh, towards the end of his life in America, he wrote two more books about the method. One was called Theory and History from the 1950s, and his last book from the early 1960s, The Ultimate Foundation of Economic Science, is entirely about the method of economics and the a priori method. So in a way, Mises felt very strongly that uh, in order for economics to have any, be any force of good, it needs to be clear about its method, which ultimately would be the a priori method. So before I uh, come to the criticism, let me just briefly clarify maybe a few things uh, furthermore about sort of Mises' um, methodology. Uh, I already sketched it uh, slightly. Um, now the first thing to say is Mises said, if we explain a phenomenon, we explain a phenomenon when we trace it back to general principles. So, so that is what every, any scientist has to do. Any other mode of explanation is denied to us. So when we, we, when we face with any kind of phenomenon, whether it's in the natural world or the social world, we need to uh, uh, trace it back to general principles. Mises' was, uh, Mises was starting point was what is called a methodological dualism. He said that, uh, we, we deal with two parts of reality, in a way. On the one hand, we deal with the outside world, with natural phenomena. Uh, 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 and on the other hand side, we have phenomena that are part of the human mind, uh, mental you know, phenomena. Uh, in a way, I understand that in the English language, of course, the word science is sometimes used as simply relating to uh, the natural sciences. Uh, now, I think traditionally, the proper meaning of the word science is sort of any organized body of knowledge and would include something like history and would include something like <coughs> economics. This is certainly the way the word is used in German. And so coming from a German background, uh, Mises uh, liked these two words, uh, which I think are very appropriate in the German language, 
where you have the overall phrase science, which is Wissenschaft, which is sort of a body of knowledge, and the subdivisions are the natural sciences, Naturwissenschaft, and the uh, uh, human uh, sciences, the Geisteswissenschaft in German. And Geisteswissenschaft is, an, is a nice phrase that captures quite nicely what Mises meant. Geist is the mind, so they are mind sciences. They deal with phenomena of the mind. And so history, for example, for Mises, was one of these Geisteswissenschaften and the mind science. Because if the, econ if the historian looks at historical phenomena, he can only make sense of history by understanding what went on in people's mind. What was the purpose, what people did, what were their thoughts. And even if they often had uh, what appears to us now as being in, uh, inferior theories uh, about the natural world or about uh, reality, uh, we need to understand how they're thought about these phenomena in, in, in these times to have any idea or make any sense of how they're acted. So it's a Geisteswissenschaft, and so is economics. Economics deals with what goes on in people's minds, as I said before, the process of valuation and purpose. Now, in theory, we can think that these two worlds are somehow connected, where maybe our emotions, our decisions, our process of valuing and purposeful behavior is ultimately driven by physical things, by chemical processes. Maybe there is some connection between the physical world and the world of our ideas. But Mises said we so far have not been able to bridge that. We've not discovered any general principle that can connect these two worlds. So we are, and as long as we don't, do not solve that problem, we are destined to operate with two very distinct realities. The natural world, natural phenomena, or outside world, the outside reality of things, and the mental world of our process of valuation, thinking, and the world of ideas and emotions and so forth. And economics focus is, is clearly situated in the world of, uh, of the mental processes. So uh, the, the, the science of human action, Mises said, that strives for universally valid knowledge is a theoretical system with hitherto best elaborated branches of economics. In all of its branches, the science is a priori, not empirical. Like logic and mathematics, it is not derived from experience, it is prior to experience. It is, as it were, the logic of action. So this is another phrase we can remember here. For Mises, economics was the logic of, of action. Now, the natural scientist also starts with observation. But importantly, for the natural scientist, the, the key essential step is also an intellectual one. Because when he observes nature, he needs to make inferences back to principles. As we said before, you know, what, what we really want to drive it is a general principle. So the, the natural scientist also looks for principles, but he uses observation uh, to derive principles from, from his observations. And the hypothesis about the relationships he observes in the natural world then can constantly be tested and verified, or as we would say, according to Popper, potentially falsified. Well, there must be two conditions for testing. Well, first is it must be, you must be able to isolate the conditions and control the conditions of an experiment. And you must deal with something that has constant relationships. And those are experimentally discoverable. Both are not given in human, uh, in, in human affairs. Every situation in human affairs is unique. You know, different people behave differently. The same people behave differently at different times. Human beings are not automatons. They are not purely instinct-driven animals. So we have to acknowledge for something, for lack of a better word, like free will. You know, we cannot classify humans or human behavior in any kind of way in which it would give us a, a, a simple pattern. And there is no uh, uh, stable relationships between uh, you know, the, the various phenomena we can observe. So in empirical sciences, the controlled experiment is, indispens is, is indispensable to isolate various factors. But in, in historical experience, we can only observe complex phenomena. If I look at you know, economic phenomena in, in, in society, in the economy, they appear as complex to me. And the only way by isolating various factors here is by using my a priori thinking, by understanding the purpose of the individual action and thereby isolating individual drivers of that complex reality. So in a way, let me, uh, maybe this becomes a bit clearer if I, if, I, if I use one of the critiques or one of the opposing ideas on economics that I mentioned earlier. And I will take here uh, a couple of the points that David Ramsey Steele makes uh, on Mises' methodology in his recent debate uh, with Robert Taylor. 
Well, here, David Ramsey Steele says, economics is an empirical science. Its claims can be tested empirically. David Ramsey Steele says, you can isolate the various factors and test them. And he gives an example. If you want to know whether a minimum wage creates unemployment, you have to look at the minimum wage in operation, isolate its effects. So the way to do that, he suggests, is you look at comparable enterprises, or maybe you look at sort of two states, maybe you know, in the United States you look at two different states, maybe one has uh, the minimum wage, another doesn't, and then you look at how these two things pan out. Uh, and you use sophisticated, as David Ramsey Steele says, you use sophisticated statistical procedures like regression analyses and other tools to isolate the various factors and test economic hypotheses. Steele even makes the statement that economics in this sense is no different from biology or chemistry. So I would argue that this is sort of a position that many modern economists take as well, and it's obviously completely opposite to, to that taken by Ludwig von Mises. Now, if we look at this position, uh, I think we can uh, first ask a few questions. You know, if we take the example of the minimum wage, so the statement is, does the minimum wage create unemployment? Now, I, I have to say that uh, I think uh, Steele believes that overall it does, and, and therefore he is against the introduction of a minimum wage, as would probably be Mises. So, but the, the question is not so much what the result is here, but it's about the methodology. Um, so if, if, if that is the starting proposition, my qu first question would be, what are we testing here? Are we, are, we, are we trying to test a theory, an economic theory, an established economic law, or are we trying to find a new theory or alter the theory? Or are we simply trying to apply an economic theory to a specific scenario in a specific case? Now, the, the, the interesting thing from my point of view is that I think if you talk about a problem like that, does the minimum wage create unemployment? I think already in their making the statement, we already see a priori thinking at work because it's very clear for every one of us that uh, these, the statement itself makes sense. Uh, that if wages go up or wages are being increased through an act of policy, it's very likely that, or it's probable, that this would have an impact on employment. If, if David Ramsey Steele had said, well, why don't we check if introducing a minimum wage would, would, uh, would uh, uh, um, lower unemployment, would actually increase employment, we would immediately have uh, been skeptical because we would see that this is a link that goes against our perception. So uh, the, the first point I make is if people talk about these phenomena, you cannot avoid thinking, applying a priori thinking. So the, uh, uh, if I start here, before I do any empirical analysis, let me look at this as I think, and as Mises would argue, and economists should look at this situation, where you start with the a priori. When we're talking about a wage, and it's very clear what a wage entails. You know, the concept of the wage entails an employer, and an employee, because the wage is, uh, needs somebody who receives the wage and somebody who pays the wage. It's entirely impossible to think of the concept of a wage without the employer and the employee, without the recipient of the wage and the payer of the wage. And it's very clear also, we can also see, because the, the concept of the wage is not a natural phenomenon, it's not something we need to observe in nature to understand it, it's a, it's a, it's a social institution, it's the result of purposeful human action that we understand, we understand the purpose behind it. We know why people work and receive wages, and we know why other people hire them and pay them wages. So it's very clear, therefore, what, what all this concept entails. And then this goes back again to the a priori concept. You know, any kind of mental approach to this problem will entail these components. And it's clear now that if the minimum wage is being raised and therefore wages go up, that, that raises, increases the income of the employee, but increases the cost of the employer. Now, furthermore, it's very clear that if the cost of one input factor in production goes up, most employers use not just labor, they use other input factors as well, so the cost of one goes up, there is an incentive for the employer to maybe economize on that more, now more expensive input factor and shift uh, and use other factors of you know, uh, production, maybe use more capital and replace labor with capital or use other means. Uh, and therefore, it's only because of these relationships that the question and the problem makes even sense to us. So what, what I argue first is, you know, this is an a priori thinking now. Now, can we as economists say that in every single situation, a minimum wage will lead to higher unemployment? Of course we cannot, because it's very clear to us already from even doing a priori thinking and not doing any statistical analysis and not doing any uh, investigation and, uh, and any, any fact finding in the real world. 
we already know that there are situations in which this will not lead to unemployment. Well, first one is, what if the state introduces a minimum wage that is so low that it is somewhat below where most wage contracts in society are currently being negotiated? You know, what if only, if, if most people, even at the lower end of the pay scale, are already employed at wages that are at or slightly above the minimum wage? If that were the case, it's likely to be expected that the minimum wage has no impact. Now, in that case, we would also say that the minimum wage would fail in its attempt, if that is the purpose, to increase the income of, of, of uh, people at the lower end of the wage scale. But uh, it, it does not necessarily increase unemployment. Well, but there are other situations. What if employers find it difficult to replace low-cost wage with capital or other factors? Uh, uh, there are two other ways they can go about this. Obviously, one is they can try and pass the extra cost onto the consumer. They can raise prices. And if they succeed in doing that, then they can maintain their profitability despite the minimum wage, and they may not let off people. There's another situation where they may, uh, be able, may not be able to pass it on to the consumer. They may not be able to rearrange their production processes. And they may decide to just sort of take the hit, to just swallow the extra cost and, lo and, and operate at a lower profitability. And I assume that those people who argue for a minimum wage often have some, something like this in mind, that it is part of a, some of a redistributive policy uh, to, to increase the income of, of, of low cost, of low earning uh, laborers. So these situations are entirely feasible. And I think no economist would say that in every given situation, uh, the introduction of a minimum wage would necessarily increase unemployment. Having said that, it's also clear from the a priori analysis I just did that the uh, that is very that is that, that the the situations I just explained are most likely to occur under certain if certain other things fall into place under certain circumstances. For example, passing on the cost to the consumer is obviously easier if, for example, you, we work in an, uh, you, the company works in an environment in which all prices tend to go up. Maybe we are just in an inflationary boom, into inflationary upswing. So all prices go up, and it's easy to pass the minimum wage on to the end consumer. Well, in that case, I would probably have to say that even if we had no minimum wage, over time, this process would have also raised the nominal wages of people, people at the lower pay scale. And it also has to be said, if indeed there is an inflationary phenomenon going on at the same time that allows the employer to pass on the cost, that then it's likely that the real wages of the minimum wage recipient doesn't go up, but just his nominal wage. So in real terms, he's not gained much. And another situation, you could argue that, well, maybe the, the industries that are affected by the minimum wage laws, the new minimum wage laws, uh, experience such a boom right now. They are in, a, in an economic upswing. Maybe they produce something that is, uh, is a very popular item right now. Maybe consumer demand has shifted uh, in a direction in which these industries do exceptionally well. So they're so profitable that they can take the hit on the minimum wage and therefore you know, willingly pay the minimum wage. But again, in that situation, we could even say, well, if that is the case, it's very likely that such a profitable business would attract competitors and that maybe other people would enter those lines of businesses or that the existing companies would expand their production and hire more people. So maybe because of the minimum wage, the unemployment doesn't rise but maybe without the minimum wage, employment was, would have risen and, and more people would have found a job uh, in the labor market. So all I've done so far right now is entirely a priori thinking. All of what I said is in the logic of, these, of, of the wage and the concept of the wage and the concept of the minimum wage. None of this requires any empirical study. So my point now my, in, 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 sort of in opposition to what David Ramsey Steele argues would be to say, what is now to be gained, from my point of view, from doing a specific analysis in a specific place and at a specific time? Um, uh, obviously, yes, we can analyze and can, for example, look at uh, the state of Ohio and see if a minimum wage of $10.25, or I think minimum wages in America are around sort of $7 or $8, uh, can see if, 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 if this has led to a rise in, in, in unemployment or not. However, you know, the, the, the purpose is still, is there a new knowledge to be gained from, from, from this? I mean, if David Ramsey Steele says you know, we can test the law of economics by empirical testing, 
my question would be, what part of the chain of reasoning I just developed on an, from the a priori, what part of that reasoning is now to be tested and would be refuted? So if in Ohio, the introduction of a minimum wage of $10 does not lead to, to a, a, a rise in unemployment, now would that now mean that there was a, an inflationary boom in Ohio, that the industries were already paying higher wages and that the minimum wage is too low? It could be a number of factors. Now, David Ramsey Steele says we can analyze specifically, we can isolate these factors. Now, first of all, I would say we can only isolate by employing the kind of a priori thinking I just developed, by only thinking about what could be factors that uh, compensate the, 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 the rising cost of labor and, and cause people not to lay off now more expensive workers. Uh, so, yes, we can, we can try to isolate that. The process of isolating this statistically already requires a priori thinking. But the result of that will just simply that we discover which factors contributed in what way. Now, the idea that we could come up with a solution that would falsify any of the laws I just used for my a priori thinking is inconceivable to us. Because would, if, even if David Ramsey Steele came up with five US states that introduced the minimum wage and did not experience high unemployment, now, I do not think that Steele expects that to happen because he does expect the statistical testing to show that unemployment goes up, and I do agree with him that that is likely, as I just explained in the a priori. But let's assume he were to find more states and that would not be the case. Would that then mean that we would say a minimum wage has no impact on employment? Could we then go back and say, well, the, the starting point of our analysis, the first law I use, that if a, one of the costs of uh, uh, complementary factors of production. If one of the costs of one of these factors goes up, uh, there is an incentive to um, uh, economize on that factor. Is that law then refuted? Would we have to then rewrite economic laws and say uh, that if uh, the, the cost of a factor of production goes up, uh, there is an incentive to replace that factor without the exception of labor? Because the minimum wage has no impact on labor. You, if you can raise the minimum wage, it will have no impact on employment. If that were the case, should we not raise minimum wages by 20, 30, 40, 50 dollars? And it's very clear that the, any of this would appear completely nonsensical to us. So the idea that the empirical testing would refute one of the key laws I used initially to analyze the problem on an a priori, none of these laws is subject to, refutation, is, is to being refuted. All that the analysis can do is can tell us which of the, the, the various factors I analyzed played a role in this specific historical ex incident, in this particular case. It, but the laws of economics are supposed to be theory. They're supposed to apply independent of time and space. They're not, I, I, you know, the economists do not look for laws that apply to Ohio and the minimum wage of $10 uh, in 2014. I wanna, want to find a general law. And the, the empirical testing that Steele suggests can never link back to refuting any of this. You know, it can never come back to the point where I have to say, yes, minimum wage will never ever, in, as a matter of principle, have no impact on employment. That would be ridiculous. And not even the advocates of minimum wages would even consider this to be a sensible statement. So in that, it, it, what becomes clear is that the debate about the minimum wage in real life, for example, in the United States right now, is not a question about the laws of economics. If we really look at it and analyze it as economists, what we find it, it is a question of a specific incident, a specific situation. And the advocates of the minimum wage, if they are honest and open about this, should really say that they propose a marginal rise in the, in the minimum wage. You know, all proposals for minimum wages are usually very close to where the market is right now because they do realize if they push this too far, it will lead to unemployment. And there is, is some kind of hope or speculation that, this, that the <laughs> employers simply take the hit and swallow the extra cost. I think as economists, arguing with the a priori, what we can do is we can show that, yeah, how risky this is. You know, from what I just explained is, uh, what I explained in the a priori and derived in the a priori, I think what we can say is that any attempt to introduce a minimum wage will either lead to higher unemployment and if it does not lead to higher unemployment, it is because of factors that in the end mean that there is no real lasting benefit to the employer because either there would be an inflation or 
uh, you know, the, the high productivity of the affected industries would have lead to higher employment in those industries over time. So the, the key statement I sh you should make as an economist about minimum wage laws is that it is an interference, interference in the market that is unable to lastingly improve the real material well-being of the people you, you want to help. That is an a priori statement. It can be derived from the a priori of wage and, and the laws of economics. And that impl implies you uniformly to any kind of minimum wage situation. You can never be in a, a situation in which you can say that in every given case, a minimum wage will lead to this result. You can never um, make the key prediction in, in, by changing one variable and changing something like the overall employment situation in a, in a, in a state, which is a complex phenomenon. Uh, and, and the only way you can make sense of that complex phenomenon is by leading back to the, its, its constituent parts, which are the a priori statements we need to start with. So in, in a way, it's, it's my perception that the, the, the desire to move to a, uh, to use the, the, the tools of the natural sciences and use statistics and empirical evidence is, I think, on the part of people like Steele, uh, is the idea that this would make uh, the argument easier, that in a, in a way would be more convincing. If we had uh, some kind of law of nature that would always tell us that this, if we do this, this happens, uh, uh, then we, there would be no debate. There would be, it, it would be clear, and maybe the economics, economics would suddenly get the uh, reputation and the acceptance in the wider, in wider society that maybe the natural sciences have. The problem is that we cannot make such statements uh, in, in the area of human affairs. You know, there are no such clear-cut relationships. What we need to do as economists is we need to go back to uh, the individual action and the purposeful behavior and derive laws from that and I do think if we apply those laws consistently, you know, the results can be as convincing and more convincing than any of the statistical analysis that Steele and others recommend. I think I'm running out of time now, so I think I... I Thank, you Thank you very much indeed. Thanks so much. Thank you. Nick, first of all, and then, you know, but Nick first. Yeah, thanks, David, for this... Uh, for this uh, Talk. However, I kind of I kind of like Austrian economics, but I, I was never I never quite understood why it, why they think uh, that Austrian economics operates completely different from other sides. Because it's I mean it's one thing to come up with a thesis, and you can come up with all kinds of theses by reasoning. And I think science does this quite a lot. I mean, if, if you think of Einstein, his uh, relativity theory. <laughs> He, he had a simple experiment at, at, the, at, the, at the beginning that showed that light was basically a not, uh, had always the same speed. And uh, from that, he, by purely re using reason, came up with, with different conclusions, put them in, into mathematical equations, and so on and so on. There was no, pr there was no observation process in, 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 in between that uh, until he came to his conclusions. But then the conclusion needs to be tested. It needs to be tested to know whether your reasoning was correct or not. And that, that's basically how our, our science generally operates. And I have a lot of sympathy for economics trying to, re, to use reason uh, to come up with, the, with, with a thesis. But I'm not convinced that you then cannot go out and, and say, um, we, we must not test this. This, this. this would be absurd to test this. I think it, 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 is, it, is, um, it has a great purpose to test this in order to know whether your reasoning was correct. Because how can you, how can you know that your reasoning was correct if, if, if you don't test it? Well, I think the, uh, well, there's a couple of points. I mean, the first is uh, I, I don't think that uh, we should say, or Mises would not have said that Austrian economics uses a methodology that is unique to itself. Well, first of all, the methodology he defended was the one that he that applied to all economics, so not just Austrian economics. And he would say that the, the, the great laws and the insights that people like Cantillon, Hume, and uh, um, uh, David Ricardo came up with were arrived by that method. And, and there wasn't even an Austrian school of economics back then. Uh, he would say that uh, but the, the key difference is here his methodological dualism, which he would say is, is very different if you deal with natural phenomena, where the relationships are stable or you can at least reasonably in, 
assume that in our lifetime they are stable. Maybe there is some kind of cosmic change that may even change certain of the what we perceive to be the natural laws on this earth. Maybe maybe different at different times in the universe or different places in the universe. So, um, uh, but it, it, within the natural sciences, you can assume that certain relationships are fairly stable. Uh, that is not the case in uh, in in in, uh, in human affairs and in, in anything you deal with it, with it, with, it, with the human mind. But that does not mean that the human affairs or uh, the idea of hu the, the world of human ideas is chaotic and that you cannot make statements about it. I think you can make statements about it, the, the kind of statements I just made about the minimum wage and the logical relationships that, that derive, arrive from changing wages in the marketplace. These are abstract statements that are part of the concept of the wage. Now, the problem is, this is what I was trying to do with the minimum wage example, is if, if, if you t analyze uh, uh, as David Ramsey Steele suggests, minimum wage situations in three or four American states, what you get is complex data. You know, you will see various wages and various points of time. Being, uh, the, the industries will be different. There will be different times in the cycle. Monetary policy will be different. Uh, the local economy will be different. Even the, I mean, uh, people, participation rates are different. You know, whether people, whether the population is younger or older and people go into the labor market or leave the labor market. Now, there is no way you can look at that and distinguish a key law of economics, uh, an economic principle, a law of economics from all that chunk of data. The, the, the way you have to, you can make sense of that is only by starting an individual human action. You arrive the a priori law of economics and use that to make sense of the, uh, of the economic phenomenon. In a way, what, what I'm saying is like if, if David Ramsey Steele finds three states in which the minimum wage has gone up or has been introduced and there was no rise in unemployment, he cannot make any statement about the fourth state. He cannot even say the chances are now six, third, or you know, uh, one third, or one fourth, or whatever the probability are he, he, he derived from the previous examples. It has no bearing on the fourth state, because there will again be unique situations and unique circumstances. So, so, so in that sense, it's very different from natural phenomena. Uh, and, uh, and therefore, the only thing we can say is by arriving sort of the a priori laws, what does it mean to raise a wage? What can be the consequences in an a priori way? And I hope what I try to do is to show that these conclusions can be very powerful. If you want to test them, you can test them by challenging me on them. We can have a, you can say my deduction was wrong. Maybe I missed a few scenarios. Maybe I missed, missed a few factors. And econom economists debate this very vigorously, and they should debate it vigorously. It's just not an empirical test. You know, yeah, that's the only but, point. But, but how, can I, how can I challenge you on something um, without, without having any, any, any data? I mean, uh, of, course, of course, I'm assuming that your reasoning is, uh, makes, makes sense. But um, I, I, I can only see that being challenged by, by, by saying, look, this data it doesn't quite apply with, with your logic. Of course, there's all kinds of problems with actually coming up with a test, because it's a very complex phenomenon. And, and, uh, but, but that doesn't, doesn't mean we, we shouldn't, shouldn't try. Well, in, in, a, in a way, I mean, just, I mean if, 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 if I tell you that the prob if, you, if you roll two dice and the probability of having a, uh, uh, coming up with a seven is 17 percent, well, you can challenge me on that. But you, you can go through the logic with me, and, and you, so, so I'm, not, I'm not saying this is now beyond challenging. It's just not challengeable by, and it would be absurd if you said like, "Well, I, I'll throw two dice now all night long to prove that left wrong." You, you see what I mean? It, 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 but, but we are dealing with the key laws of economics. We are dealing with something that is akin to mathematics and logic, and you would not test a mathematician by 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 uh, supposing empirical testing. But, math, but mathematics is a bit different in, in the sense that you can come up with, with uh, an indefinite number of mathematical systems. You said that 2 plus 2 is 4. But of course in mathematics 2 plus 2 can also be 1 or it can be 2. It depends on which mathematics you're using. So mathematics can only be applied to reality if you test if, 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 if there is some kind of connection between the mathematics you're using and the reality. Because all kinds of mathematics would, would, would tell you nonsense about, about, about reality. That's the difference between mathematics and, and economics. Because economics, you, you're dealing with real things. And mathematics is more uh, an abstract, logical language. 
Well, I mean, I can only say, like, I, I would, I would, I would agree with Mises that economics is not like math, and he would, he would not say, but, but it is in its process, it's close to math and to the natural sciences. Long list, there's a long list there. Uh, so we better move. That, that's an interesting exchange, but. Uh, Yes. Thank you. Thank you for your paper. Uh, it's been very interesting. One thing that occurs to me is a scenario which you didn't touch upon, or at least uh, the way you touched upon, uh, and that was increasing the productivity of the person whose wages are increased, especially if they're within manu the manufacturing area. So that if a person is paid more, yet they produce more in order to, as, a, as a contribution towards the manufacturing cost of a product, then if their wages go up, but they produce more, they're using more raw materials, but the actual cost of the good produced should not increase. Yeah of, of course, yeah, of course, but I mean, uh, but uh, no, I, I fully agree. But I mean, obviously economists, and again, in, 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 in taking a complex phenomenon and going back to first principles and to the key underlying principles, you know, you're, you're always, you use what we economists call sort of the uh, Ketteris paribus uh, assumption, the all else being equal assumption. You know, you say that we change one thing, we, ch we change the minimum wage, but all else stays the same. Now, I, I broke that principle myself before. So what you're basically saying is, so what, what if we raise the minimum wage and at the same time there is an increase, there happens to be an increase in productivity? Mm -hmm. uh, of course, then in that case, uh, the, uh, the, it's no problem because the employer is then in a good position to pay the higher minimum wage because the productivity of the worker is higher. But that would be a lucky coincidence and I would argue it can happen, but the, the key point is if it does happen, then the wage would go up even if there was no minimum wage because it's clear that if the productivity of a worker goes up, but his pay stays low, it attracts other people, it attracts, it attracts other investment into that line of business. Again, all else being equal, assume that all else is being equal. Uh, uh, and it could attract more because now, you know, the profitability of the business goes up. People produce more, but they're not being paid more. Obviously, this again assumes that the entry into the market is free and that other competitors can enter the market, that there's no restriction to enter that specific line of business. So we cannot, be, but I think what you're doing is entirely correct. You know, we, 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 we look at the various ways that this can pan out and analyze the, the circumstances. But uh, we need to always isolate these factors to make them intelligible to us. And we cannot start from an economic phenomenon and then uh, uh, derive the laws by going through the statistical data. So in your case, I would say yes. If 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 the unemployment, if the minimum wage has gone up, there's no rise in unemployment. One potential explanation could be that it so happened that productivity also went up at the same time. That is absolutely correct. It caused it to go up. It co it, you could imagine. Unless they work harder. Oh yeah. Well. Say, say that again, Brian. Threatening to fire people if they don't work more productive, because they have to to keep their job. People can be forced to earn the Okay, yeah, okay, oh, yeah, 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 that's, 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 that's also a possibility, of course. That's yeah, also Bob, possible. You're, you're, that's also uh, possible. Is it possible, yeah. and it isn't? Um, <laughs> so, next question. <laughs> to empirically demonstrate that when people are given a choice between the, the ownership, they haven't got to carry it home, they simply have it, it's theirs. They can immediately sell it on, they can do what they like with it. When they have a choice of two goods, how can we empirically test that they choose the one that's most valuable to them, or their projects, or their plans, or whatever it may be? In other words, they'll choose to come into possession of the thing they value the most. Now, I think it's too to say they will, because, because we say, what does it mean to for a person to have, to have, to not have? this instead of that, to gain from this instead of that. But you cannot possibly do an empirical test to show it is a priori. That is. But yeah, I think that that's a very good point, Paul. I fully agree. I mean, I think it's a priori. But again, very importantly here that the economist uh, there's a very sharp line between economics and psychology, right? So the, the, the psychologist may actually ask himself or herself the question of what is it that causes a person to value this more than that? And, and, and why do, does a person value this more than the other? The economist doesn't ask these questions. Once a person has values something more than the other and begins to act on that, the economist looks at that specific action and says, aha, that the person is, is no longer buying this item, is buying instead that item. So that what are the economic implications of that change in action? 
it, it, he does not look, the economist does not look deeper into what are the psychological drivers. That again, I assume, would be a question of the natural sciences and potentially something that can be tested, uh, you know, statistically and empirically, but is fundamentally different from the questions that economists ask. Uh, well, first of all, uh, this chap, and then this chap, and then <laughs> sorry, so this chap first. Okay, then. Um, I think you're making you're like Mises. You're thinking, you're assuming you have to either believe the theorem 100 percent or not, and I don't really think that's true. But let me give an example. Um, if you write a very simple computer program. You might be able to look at the code and then determine what it does, and you'd be correct. But you write a very complex program, and it might have bugs, so you've got to go and test it. And even in mathematics, you might have a theorem um, that you think you're, you have a deductive proof, and all your colleagues think the proof is correct, but then someone could ultimately come and give you a counterexample. For very simple theorems like Pythagoras' theorem, that's probably not going to happen, um, because everyone in the world agrees that the the deductions behind Pythagoras' theorem are correct, but everyone could be mistaken. And the more complex the proof, the more likely that is to happen. So I just want to come back to when you were talking about the minimum wage. You were saying, after we've made this deductive argument with the minimum wage, all other things being equal, we'll put up wages, you say, what is to be gained by going to the facts and actually seeing, because there could be all sorts of confounders. Um, now, obviously, I would say there's, it's, it would be silly to have an entirely empirical economics. Um, for example, the Phillips curve, where Phillips goes and says, I've done some experiments and I see that there's a relationship, a correlation between inflation and employment, and he posits a theory which turns out to be wrong. But you seem to be going to the opposite, opposite extreme. You say there's literally nothing to be gained from going to the evidence. But surely you might find that even after you've stripped out as many confounders as you can think of, ultimately the evidence must, might force you to go back and re-examine your deductions. And it seems much more sensible to me to say that we have a very high degree of confidence that minimum wages, all other things being equal, um, will increase unemployment, and most of the evidence that we look at, look at doesn't really affect our confidence uh, in that. But we might come across some evidence in the future which makes which makes us drastically reduce our confidence in our theory. Well, I think first to clarify on the minimum wage, I mean, obviously my point was I can conceive, and I think together now in our discussion we've already come up with a couple of additional points where we can construct situations in which a minimum wage is being introduced and unemployment does not go up, right? But without this... Re, uh, uh, re, um, um, co 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 uh, confounding the uh, the economic principles, the a priori principles that we use to describe the problem. Yeah, so, so, so in a way, the idea that one, if you're forced by, by state intervention that a certain price, the price of labor, goes up, you know, it's likely that people are going to economize on labor. That is the economic law that is at question here. And there is no historical experience that will confound that law. You know, even if you find five or six or seven or ten, I don't care how many states in which minimum wage was introduced, it must then be due down to these other factors because the idea that the price of labor is, has no embearing whatsoever on the employment it's nonsense. It's not that that's uh, that's a that's a, that goes against the a priori, and it's not so. So, so, so you know, in a way, that, that is my key point. Well, I think the, the way the way I, I, if I understand your question correctly, you can see what if I make a statement that you know printing money would lead to inflation, and now everybody around the world, all central banks, keep printing money for ten years, for twenty years, for thirty years, and inflation never goes up. Would that encourage me to go back to my a priori reasoning and check it more thoroughly? Uh, uh, yeah, m m maybe it would. I'm, I'm not saying, you see what I'm saying, it's not that you should not check a priori thinking or reasoning, that you should not challenge that or test it. You can always t test it. But the way you would then test it is you have to go again through your premises. The, the historical experience, the specific historic incident and case in itself can never tell you what, were the, were the, what the drivers were. You need the a priori toolkit the, the, the basic a priori laws to disentangle the complex reality and make sense of it. 
so 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 that 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 I think was my. Point. Does that answer your question? I'm not yeah, sure. I don't think we disagree. Uh, okay. Ah, now it's just this chap. Yeah, that's right. That chap there, and then. That's right. right. And then uh, and then David. I'm a psychologist by trade. Uh, so, uh, as such, I'd like to say I think you've made quite an articulate restatement of uh, Mises' argument that. Um, Economics derives from, from a priori uh, considerations. Um, but uh, Mises, although he was a praxeologist by trade himself, um, one time ventured into psychology. He wrote a book called The Anti Capitalistic Mentality. And he tried to explain why it was that such hostility uh, towards the idea of capitalism was very typical. Um, and his main idea was that um, essentially it's a rationalization of. of that was one of the main theories he came, came up with. So I wonder if you'd like to speculate why there is a, an anti-a priori uh, mentality or a pro-a posteriori mentality. It seems that if you look at the state of economics today, most economists seem to, seem to favor the a posteriori approach. So I'm wondering if you'd like to speculate on why that is the case. Why do they disdain um, this emphasis on I guess rational deduction. Um, why should it be the case that uh, people like uh, you know people call Mises a crank for his, his rationalistic approach? Uh, do you have any any speculation as to why that might be the case? Uh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, I mean, first of all, I need to say, I mean, this is entire speculation on my part now, and it's not part of Mises' argument or uh, argument for the a priori. So I'm speculating now about the question, wh why is there so much apathy towards the a priori concept? And I think there are a couple of reasons for that. I think one is indeed that, uh, well, I, th I think, I suspect there may be, most people find it easier to... Uh, learn from experience or look, uh, you know, or, or any kind of solution or any kind of problem or, or any kind of connection to, to see it played out in front of them, and, you know, is, 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 is maybe more, it's easier for people to grasp certain concepts than to derive, uh, to, to uh, use deduction and logic and abstract thinking to maybe arrive at the same thing. So I, I think people have this idea that if they see something, even 2 plus 2 equals 4, I mean, probably we all learned it by, by having apples or oranges in front of us. So, so I, I do think often it is that is it maybe, there is, maybe there's a psychological explanation that is, that is easier for us. I think there are other reasons. I do think that uh, uh, there is envy uh, among economi many economists, I believe, uh, of the natural sciences because they are more respected. And I think the, the a posteriori method of, of uh, empirical si uh, sciences uh, are more respected. Uh, I think that's one reason. I think Mises would probably have said that uh, the enemies of economics, the, as I said in my talk, people who do not like the conclusions of economics, for example, that a minimum wage always and everywhere has the potential to destroy jobs. There's, that, that is clear. That is a priori the case. It may not happen in every single case, but structurally it has. That is such a, a, a clear statement that people would rather have a, a weaker statement that says, well, you know, but it, hey, it worked in Ohio, it worked in Cleveland, so maybe we can do it in Massachusetts. So, 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 so that's another reason. And there is a further one, which is, you know, in empirical sciences, everybody can do empirical testing. Everybody who works in a laboratory and, and collects data or statistical data can be one of the scientists. And you can, in a way, you can think of yourself as contributing to the science. You, 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 the, the advancement of science, you're part of it. That's great. But if you work in mathematics or logic or economics, only very, very, very few people are a David Ricardo or a, a, a Richard Cantillon. We see this complex reality and are able to derive an a priori rule from that. So the, uh, sometimes people say, well, if, you, if, you, if your view of economics is that of Mises and the a priori, my God, what was the last great insight of economics? Well, yeah, we have to go some time back. You know, I think there's only, Mises used to say there are only 10 people or 12 people in the world who really fully understand the body of economics, let alone contribute to it. But if you work in, in, in sciences that are based on constant empirical testing, everybody is part of this great endeavor of engaging into science. So it's, it's a much more democratic view. Uh, I think even, I think probably, I would guess, mathematicians would also argue that big breakthroughs in math and math ma mathematics were only done by really few exceptional people, and they do not happen all the time. 
So that's another reason maybe why that is a way of thinking and, and doing science that is not uh, much liked. I think, it's interesting. I think it's an interesting contrast with mathematics because I think there's more, more room in mathematics for people to make piecemeal contributions. But in economics, if you follow the a priori method, it seems that unless you make a huge contribution, you discover a new type of economic law, and maybe they've all been discovered, maybe many have, um, your contribution is, is very little. So even though mathematics is abstract, like, like economics is abstract, there seems to be more room for making a piecemeal contribution uh, in, in yeah. mathematics. I think that's correct. I mean, I think, I think in a way, and again, so, uh, as I said, Mises thought that economics is hugely important. So I think the idea that people teach economics and teach people the, the, to think as economists and learn about economics is very important. So there would be a role in Mises' world for lots of economists as being teachers, but for them to think that they are, that they advance the science of economics like David Ricardo did, that would be, uh, uh, yeah, Cooper's. Uh, a couple of observations and a, a, a statement, or, or maybe two statements. Uh, sure. Um, so you use the analogy of uh, a dice. Uh, most people are familiar with the conceptual model of the dice and the die. Um, a lot of people are also familiar with the conceptual model of the loaded die, which, when examined empirically, uh, gives a different result than you expect from the, from the conceptual model. Um, <clears throat> with that in mind, uh, I have to think back to a talk given by Sam Bowman, uh, which I organized. Um, <laughs> plug there, the Open Cat Speaks. But what was interesting uh, about that talk, it wasn't just to give a summary of the state of debate, a lot of the empirical stuff uh, going on right now, um, but that he was coming at it from the point of view of uh, someone who worked in the think tank. Uh, and he is not really looking to discover the truth. Uh, I think, uh, I'm not sure we are either. I think most of the people in this room are fairly persuaded that minimum wage is a bad idea, for example, and they might be right. But the point is not that we are sure. The point is really that we've got to persuade other people. Otherwise, we're not going to benefit at all, because this is a political matter. We're not going to benefit at all from our knowledge unless we can persuade other people. So there is a reason to go out and measure and test and take an empirical approach. And it is a competitive reason. The reason is this. Your opponents are doing it, and they're finding cases and empirical evidence that disprove the conceptual model. And I think the, the audience, if you like, are willing to assume that it's something like a loaded die, something that just varies for some reason from the conceptual model. Um, and there's something going on which we don't necessarily know, but there's empirical evidence that proves it. We don't know what it is, but we prove it. Proved it has an effect, and therefore we shouldn't listen to those free market people at all. So for competitive reasons, I would say we need to go out and do some empirical research. And actually show that we're not persuading ourselves, we should be persuading our people. Uh, yeah, I think, I think this is... Uh... I think what you're trying to do is something very different, obviously, from what Mises tried to do in being a scientist. Uh, Mises... M Mises uh, as sort of the gentleman over there, we asked the question about uh, uh, the uh, um, uh, about the you know, why do not people like the Aparo method? Uh, as this gentleman said, I mean, Mises also wrote a book on the anti-capitalistic mentality, and he wrote a book called Liberalism, where he argued for the classical liberal society. But when he did those, uh, wrote those things, and argued politically, argued for political um, for certain policies. He always said he's not arguing as an economist. He's not arguing as a scientist, but as, as, a, as a, you know. A, so, so in a way, we have to clearly distinguish here. If, if you're a scientist, you're interested in the truth. It, is not, it doesn't really that matter that much what, what the uh, implications are right now. I mean, Mises felt that if people see the truth in economics and understand economic laws, it will lead to different policies and different thinking and a different behavior and, and to a better, more prosperous world as it, as it did with the rise of economics over the last 300 years. But the role of the, of the, of the, uh, of the scientist has just to be to seek for the truth. So, so we need to distinguish between these two things, economic theorizing and propaganda. And I think a lot of the, 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 the think tanks are obviously involved in propaganda. Uh, um, I think the risk is, as, as, and again as a social scientist or as an economist, the risk if you use, if you throw around statistics, you know, you always get into these situations as they happen all the time, 
Then somebody say, okay, if you introduce a minimum wage, uh, it, would, could, could, it threatens jobs. People come up with, oh no, it, we, we've introduced it here and there, and it didn't. You know, it, it didn't happen here. And suddenly this becomes all very relativistic. And I think, again, this is maybe one of the reasons why people like the, the treating economics as a natural science, because then, then they can argue all kinds of cases. We, we always find something. It's a little bit like somebody sees, if somebody sees a balloon fly, but seeing a balloon fly does not mean that Newton was wrong in gravity. You know, we, we, we can make sense of this phenomenon. But in, 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 in economic statistics, that's often what happens. You know, people say, okay, the, the you know, central banks have been printing money for the last five years, you know, doing quantitative easing. Where's the inflation? But again, even the people who argue along those lines and defend, for example, that policy of the central banks cannot argue that you can print any sort of number and it will never lead to inflation. The conceptual idea that ultimately there is a link between the quantity of money and inflation has to be accepted by everybody speaking about the topic. Nobody can deny that link. The only question then is, what is that link kind of broken? Are there uh, mitigating factors? Are there factors that make this process not as smooth or direct as it used to be? But these are specific questions. But the a priori idea that you know there is a relationship between how much money you print and what inflation is, there is definitely a connection, a priori. Uh, I think nobody can test that. But the moment you come into these political debates, people just throw around these statistics. And I, th I think, personally, the argument against the minimum wage becomes stronger if you do not use the statistics, if you make it clear to people what are the underlying factors, under what circumstances do employers really happily swallow the, the higher minimum wage, and you will find that, you know, other than in the, in the happy coincidence of, a rise, of rising productivity, this will probably be because they're taking a hit and that will in long time undermine their ability to invest and will have other consequences. Uh, and I think the a priori argument, from my point of view, is ultimately the stronger one. David. Yeah. Uh, uh, how much of what you describe as a problem is really surprising to you? It is as much of what you have been describing as an argument. It is just the use of the activities and the economics. Uh, and it might be. Not necessarily the same thing as the a priori, which is the starting for all this process. Now, am I am I drawing a false distinction there? Uh, or, uh, or, 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 <laughs> can you talk? You are. <laughs> no, I think I think I mean I'm not quite sure if, if this this is just terminology now without changing any of the. I mean I, I no I, I think I think there, there is there is. I use deduction. You know, there is there is a starting point, and then there is deduction. So I think no, I think I think I think you're yeah. right. I think the key point here is that this entire intellectual process is prior to experience. You know, it is not fundamentally changed or altered by empirical evidence or experience. It is it, it is prior to experience. It is, I mean, it, it, if the correct description is that Austrian economics is ultimately Well, yeah. I mean, I would, I would, I would argue it's not, it's not, it's not wrong. I have to say, though. I mean, careful with the, with the use Austrian economics because I do think that Mises was the outstanding representative of the Austrian school, certainly in the 20th century. But even many of the people who call themselves Austrian school economists did not follow Mises in methodology. And you can say that from the, from the late 1930s, even Friedrich August von Hayek, his most famous uh, people, you know, diverted from, from Mises slightly. But then from the 1950s well, kind of on... He can't be, yeah, but, but then from the 1950s, he didn't do any economics really anymore and became basically a social philosopher, Hayek, since well, the 1950s. Well, well, he did his, uh, his little pamphlets on denationalization de of money. Yeah. But, they, it, but again, denationalization of money, I would argue, does not... And he also wrote essays in two volumes, uh, essays on sociology, uh, psychology, philosophy, and economics. No, no legislation and liberty. Uh, no, no, the, yeah. the two little volumes of essays. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, the first one was in 1967, the other one was in 1977. But then uh, they, uh, And new studies. Yeah. Uh, uh, yes, studies, yes. Yeah. Studies in, and then new studies. Yeah. Uh, uh, Bob. Uh, David Hume 
Well, next to you. It is paradoxical. I know you are. I know. Uh, there's a long list, I'm sorry about that. And Brian's there as well. He could, the David Hewitt, the man who patently sat in his armchair in his study, because of stuff, um, didn't get out much. He, um, he read a lot and he thought a lot. And um, when he reasoned about the consequences of a fairy arriving and putting extra money on the bedside table, um, he did that by reasoning, deductive reasoning. A priori, or armchair priori, as <laughs> some of us call it. In other words, he didn't have to go out and check. So, but also, as well as doing that, he also said that famously there were merely relations of ideas. So that's kind of tautology, or just mathematics. Or something. And then there's empirical matter. And he was the one, and I came to try to change it, and so we're trying to fight this in certain ways. But Hume is trying, insofar as science has to be empirical, has to be things that have to be tested, that could be um, false in some universe, we may not be in the right universe, but as the a priori method means, for any creatures that value, that have private property, money, money, develop money, exchange good, that certain things can be said of these creatures, simply because they value, they believe, they don't agree, they have different plans, there are certain things we can say about the essential properties of all market economies, that can be said. Now, whether you have to grow up, look around you, and, as well as think, plainly, readers wouldn't disagree with that. But when you do the reasoning, you do it in your study, and you don't have to go any out and engage in empirical research. This needs to be just true, but David Hume is the man who, in a sense, made that not science. Okay, I'm not, I'm not quite sure if that's again sort of a linguistic or you know, question of, of, of the terminology. I think the key point here is that if you expect the area of human affairs, of, of uh, the world of human action, of the economy, to be predictable in, a, in the kind of way and, and, uh, and be subject to strict laws that make that world predictable in the sense that a lot of the phenomena in the natural world or the physical world are fairly predictable. You know, if, if we put two hydrogen atoms and an oxygen atom together, we get water. That's always the case. And uh, there are few things in human, or probably no human uh, things in the, in the world of, of, of human uh, action that are this straightforward and predictable. And again, it starts uh, with Mises' idea that, uh, or perception that the, the starting point is always the process of valuation. And people value differently, and that may change over time. So if we want to have discover any kind of regularity, we have to start from that premise. And that's what we then can do intellectually is by using, as David says, deductive logic from those starting blocks to come up with hopefully the right theories. Uh, and, and, and that can constantly be discussed and tested, you know, but, but, but in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the realm of, uh, of um, debate and criticism and analysis, not by empirically testing them. You know, that, that, that's, I think that is the conclusion. If you then want to not call that science and just leave the term science for those that, things that can be empirically <laughs> tested, that's a, that's a different uh, point. But I think Mises always stresses, and, and I, think they, I think one of the reasons, and maybe it's another psychological reason, why people struggle with Mises, is because people have the idea that if someone says something is a priori the case, they consider that person to be arrogant. Uh, it's basically the idea that well, you, you, you know, you're no longer your buff criticism. You know, you, we cannot even debate this. Of course you can debate it. I encourage you to debate my statement about the probability of the dice or the statements I made about the, the minimum wage, you know, or even the, the things I argue in my book where I, over many pages, are make an a priori case why elastic forms of money are not superior, are actually inferior, and always have to be, than inelastic forms of money. That's an a priori case, and I think it's an, a law of economics. I didn't discover it. I just tried to articulate it well. But it obviously goes against the current mainstream. And I encourage everybody to uh, uh, challenge that. It can be challenged, it can be discussed. It, there is just no empirical evidence uh, testing for that. If I may just say one more thing, and I'm sorry that uh, uh, John Lester isn't here anymore. Maybe I already bored him. To, no, I think, uh, he, I think he's upset by the noise next door. Oh, uh, OK. Uh, uh, because uh, and, and, and maybe well, maybe I shouldn't say this because he can't defend himself now. But oh, he'll hear uh, it. He'll be <laughs> he will be outside. And yeah, no, uh, he'll hear it, and, and he'll, re he'll probably reply on okay, the blog good. or the the. Uh, no, I, I think I think I don't want to put words in it. But if if you read a book like like <laughs> Jan Lester's on uh, Escape from the Wife, 
where he analyzes sort of uh, uh, the uh, an, an, uh, a libertarian society and why why that is a preferable society. A society, I would say, a lot of his reasoning is obviously deductive, and it is, in my view, a priori in many in many ways. Because, for example. John writes about uh, how could we imagine a world operate that is not driven by the state as a as a central um, you know authority and where we have insurance companies which uh, maybe even punish people and uh, yes yeah, so protect people and then also run prisons and now he makes some very intelligent points about this which are obviously not you know empirically testable and I think the the, the test of what he describes a libertarian society to be like. Have to be in the in the in the area of logic. Uh, I think is and, and he encourages because his entire book is taking on criticisms of libertarianism, which is always criticism in in in, in the area of ideas and concepts and theory, and uh, he deals with this, this criticism. And I think everybody can engage in this. So I think it's not arrogant at all. It's not an arrogant procedure. It's open for debate and criticism, just not for empirical testing. You know that, that I think that is the key message. Stephen. I'd like, yeah, I'd, I'd like to make a couple of points. Uh, one is that I think there is a distinction between uh, logical systems and uh, the real world. You give that example of uh, the throwing of the die and that you have a one in six chance of it coming up free, say. Well, that is a logical truth. It may not apply in the real world. You know, you could have a real world where matter was such that uh, each die was loaded. And you've never got that situation. But your logical truth would not be incorrect, therefore, even though it never happened in the real world. And uh, I'm nothing against the Misesian system, developing a system like that, but it's just still worthwhile to do empirical testing and look at the real world. And the other thing I'd, I'd say is you always make this point that there's always noise in the background when you're looking at, say, minimum wages and looking at across the borders in American states, there always will be noise there. That's no reason that you can't uh, derive laws and that they can hold. For instance, uh, the science of biology, I guess you would put it in the um, natural sciences. Of course, it, it involves immensely complex phenomena, phenomena uh, lots of animals acting uh, in uh, complex ways. And Darwin arrived at his uh, theory of evolution by natural selection by uh, empirically looking at these animals and then deriving the law. And now, uh, biologists often treat this law as if it were, were an I've, I've listened to them, they treat it as if it were an apron or That's right, they do. And it leads to various conclusions. Nothing wrong with that either. And they've even imported various economic terms like investment, and such like in, in biological science. But they don't take this line that it, it, it is an a priori science, biology now within the uh, scheme of uh, evolution by natural selection. It's still an empirical science to them. Yeah. I think the... Uh, I, I, think, I think the first point is, uh, if, if I understand the first point correctly about something, you said there is still place for you know, emp empirical data and testing. Now, I, I think one of the things, obviously, we can... Uh, always agree on is that if you do look at the real world, you may find economic situations that are interesting then for you to investigate as an economist. So, so you may discover an economic problem or you, you arrive at an economic question because you look at empirical data and, and, you, and you, you observe something where you think, well, oh, could there be an economic law behind this? But it's always the process then you arrive at the law that always uses the a priori method. I would disagree with your statement. The one statement you made um, at some point in your question was that you said uh, there's still a way you can derive an economic law from it. And that is what I would challenge. If you look at, you know, there is no way, you, if you look at, I think I said this probably before, but if you look at a whole range of states that introduce a minimum wage, you know, even if you find that the majority of them did not have a rise in unemployment, the question is then, you have to ask yourself, what economic laws ha have you refuted, existing law have you refuted, or what new law have you discovered? And I would, my challenge to that proposition would be, well, you have not refuted any of the a priori laws I mentioned earlier, and you have not discovered a new one either. If, if the purpose would be to say, aha, there is no link between a minimum wage and 
the, the, the employment, we already agreed that this would be a nonsensical statement because you just have to use, kick up the, uh, the minimum wage to $1,000 an hour and you will definitely get unemployment. Nobody would, would, would even uh, uh, you know, challenge you on that one. So I do think, as I said before, the concept of the wage and the minimum wage always entails certain you know, deductive necessities conclusions that make economic laws. And those are outside of experience and therefore outside testing. So what you, what you do investigate in the empirical research is you analyze and you probably maybe understand better and, and grasp better specific instances at that point in time and at, in that place. For example, that the minimum wage of a certain level did not have a big impact and, and you can maybe distill the reasons why that was. Maybe because there was huge gains in productivity as the gentleman that suggested. And, and that's entirely feasible. But you can only make sense of these by working with the a priori concept that we originally uh, arrived before you had the experience. Now, the, uh, the, the, I think the, 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 uh, and, and the challenge to the laws of evolution, I would say that, you know, I don't think that is, that you may, people may treat it as an a priori science, but it's not an a priori science for the simple reason that the definition I gave earlier, that an a priori is something, is, uh, that uh, the characteristic feature of a priori knowledge is that we cannot think of the truth of its negation of something that would be at variance with it. I think you can. We all could fairly easily imagine that we would find something that isn't in that. It is, is a, in actual fact, as Mises says, it is a bit of, ec uh, of economics, the uh, Darwin's, and he got it from Malthus, of course. And and, and uh, what well, armchair philosophers, of course, the, the armchair contributions is not only Darwin, but also Einstein. If Stephen Hawking says philosophy is dead, well, you ought to consider there might be another Einstein who does most of the, the contributions from the chair. Chris, I don't know, it must be Christian's turn. No, this is your turn. You put your hand up before. Oh, right. And then it's his turn next. And then it's Brian. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, that is the cue now. It's going down. I withdraw because I was going to mention evolutionism. Topic relevant, and I don't need to anyway. Oh, so it's Chris next, and then Michelle. Yeah. I just hope that what, I, what I'm asking hasn't been answered in, in the last uh, oh, yes. few minutes of discussion. Well, I, hope, I hope not. That's, let me, let me try and see. I just, uh, I'm, I'm interested in the relationship between policy and uh, the, the a priori thinking that you're talking about. It, it, does, it does seem that there, uh, it would seem that there is right. quite literally Look no policy there. prescription to follow. And certainly, I, you know, you wouldn't expect any matter of fact to follow from any matter of logic. So, um, Mises' Mises thinking uh, can presumably be used to make sense of anything that happens, really, including um, the consequences of any policy that a politician introduces. So um, it makes me wonder why it, one thinks it is natural for um, people who think like Mises to be less fair, to be natural libertarians, and so on. And yet, that's a bit mysterious. That why should they be that rather than a complete, you know, eurogesis? No, no, but, but because they make sense of anything that happens. No, I, I would say I was actually saying quite the opposite. Because you know, again, if you come back, uh, although I mean, we probably kicked this horse enough for <laughs> almost now with the minimum wage. But I, I go back to the minimum wage again. No, Mises obviously a priori, the a priori reasoning I, I hopefully employed correctly in in my example is it, the conclusion is very clear. There should be no minimum wage because in every single instance you create incentives for people to economize on labor and, 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 and you know, uh, lay off people and replace their work with other input factors. It, it is only in a certain situation that we can come up with where this may occasionally not be the case, and we can think of those, but I, I already went through some of them, in which case then obviously there would be no material benefit to those people who get the minimum wage, for example, because there is an overall inflation or uh, there is a, um, uh, what's the other one, uh, or the minimum wage is so low that it doesn't really affect the labor market. And uh, you, we can make other factors. So, so what I'm saying is, if you go through these a, a, a priori reasoning of Mises, what is very clear is that the only way you can guarantee that you allow in, in society people to improve their material well-being is to not interfere in market prices. I mean, Mises is very clear on that, so I think they're very clear uh, 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 policy prescription following from a priori thinking here. The, but but it's, it's not in the sense that you say, well, if you do this, then always in every single instant, exactly this phenomenon will result from that. But you simply say, if you do this, always and everywhere, you create these incentives, you kick off these processes, 
and therefore is very highly probable at least that your adverse effects result. And I think the argument for less affair is stronger of that because if you get to the point, as we discussed earlier, where <laughs> economists uh, move back and forth on statistics and somebody says, well, the minimum wage has resulted in unemployment here but not unemployment there, you lose the much stronger a priori analysis of what you know, uh, any, every minimum wage must do. If the minimum wage is applied in such a way that it materially affects the nominal wages of low-income earners, it will create a strong incentive for employers to economize on labor. That is a priori too, and therefore I think it's a very strong policy prescription. I don't think it's, it's, it's uh, relativistic at all. In the previous mm -hmm. example, uh, where we imagined a, um, uh, a rise in minimum wage coinciding with an increase in productivity, you thought of them as completely coincidental, just, just uh, you know, a, a coincidental external factor, the rise in productivity. But suppose that the rise in productivity was the consequence of um, the rise in the minimum wage. Um, you've got healthier workers, or their self-esteem improves, or something like that. And they become more, and they become more productive. It does, now that's not exactly a coincidental fact. And, and you know, you can imagine, you know, your average graduate. The more that causes the improvement in productivity is the point, isn't it? Yeah. That's very imaginable. It is imaginable. Yeah. yeah, I think, I think, I think it is imaginable. I would still, uh, it, 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 is, it is imaginable, it's still, the, there's obviously a strange aspect to that, because you the would argue... The argument against it is not in the circumstances of the people who work a little bit harder with a little bit greater self-esteem and so on. It is that jobs become even further out of reach of people who haven't got them now because they're not able to be worth that wage. The, 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 the goal of getting any kind of employment has got even further away from these people. You don't see that. You see all this activity at the margin with workers. <coughs> what you don't see is the equally significant less activity among people who say, well, what is the point of me trying to get a job now? They've got hard. Yes, if I could get one, I'd be paid more, but I've got even less chance of getting one of these damn jobs. And that re than results to... Uh... And that makes things worse. And it's, it's basically the, the forgotten man of, of uh, minimum wage laws. Yeah, but, but what, what you've now done, Brian, is basically you used a priori reasoning. Uh, absolutely. A, a priori absolutely. reasoning to yes, develop right. another interesting case exactly of, the, of, the, of, the, of the minimum wage not increasing measurable unemployment, mm -hmm. but at the same time having adverse you're, social effects. You're completely right. right, and I'm trying to answer Simon's point about how you have to use statistics or you have to get enmeshed in it if you're going to win these fights on the radio and in the in the prints. Uh, I produce a different kind of argument altogether against the minimum wage law, which as you say is based on our a priori thinking. There, there, there. So first of all, it's def definitely an a priori point. I mean, I would say, I mean, obviously, I mean, I, I would assume that you can then argue that in, in, in many situations the level of productivity of a worker is not simply determined by his willingness to work hard. You, you see what I mean? I mean, many, many people, in particular in low-paying jobs, and this may now be an empirical point and not an a priori point, but uh, 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 many, many, many people, many, many, but does, it, doesn't, it doesn't weaken my argument, it's just an example. But many, you'd have to say, like, if you pay people more, then there, then there are more better workers for whatever reason. Uh, but that would mean that sort of the productivity of, 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 a, of a worker is mainly uh, uh, determined by his specific attitude. And you can argue that there are many processes in which that is not necessarily the case. I'm not quite sure if somebody works maybe at, I don't know, Domino Pizzas or uh, McDonald's, whether, whether, you know, his productivity is just, uh, it can be increased by him just, just being a bit more cheerful and, 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 uh, uh, and engaged with his work. So, 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 the, so that's the first point I, I would make. Then the other point is, if indeed there are, in fact, as there always are politicians who argue along these lines, in the debate in America now, there are politicians who will argue that supposedly there are studies, and that's obviously the standard argument, that show if you pay people more, they're happier workers and they're better workers, so the minimum wage will actually help uh, you know, uh, companies make more money. It, now, the, 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 the interesting thing here is obviously that you think, well, would it take politicians in Washington to figure that out and not the people who run the businesses? Mm -hmm. So, so I, I, I think that's a very strange argument to argue that people will, uh, you make it their life to run a business and invest their money in it, that they, they, they don't find the simple trick 
of encouraging the people with a bit more money, if that indeed leads then to more productive, productive work and then to higher mm. profits. So, so that, that makes that argument, I think, again, slightly weak. But again, I think this is an interesting debate here. And, and obviously, you brought up points that I did, didn't even think about when, when I went through all the angles of the minimum wage. But again, the point clearly, Brian, is a priori, as you said yourself. Mm -hmm. and, and I think, to me, I believe that is still the strongest basis for having such an economic argument than throwing around statistics about specific historical cases. Mm -hmm. I suppose Bastia yeah, understood this with his un unseen consequences. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Christian? Yeah, th th thank you very much. I mean, it was Sorry, absolutely brilliant, and you have been sort of talking diligently for uh, two hours now, so, uh, which I think is uh, another uh, feature. So, um, I, um, a couple of things. I mean, this distinction between a priori and a posteriori, I don't quite understand, because I think that a reasoning, any kind of reasoning, um, has to be uh, connecting with a reality outside us to be relevant. And, um, well, in other words, I can construct something like some fantasy, and it will be a fantasy. It won't tell me anything about the real world. Um, so, the, what, what happens here is that, and, and going back to what Nico was saying, we have to test something about the speed of light and general relativity or whatever. Or we have to test uh, by looking at fossils, evolution, and, and so on. Because we have no knowledge of this. But we have knowledge of human beings, because we are human beings. And we see human beings around us. And we have seen human beings since we were born. And therefore, we have built up a knowledge of how human beings interact. Uh, interact. And when we say things like, uh, well, if there is an increase in the price of a good, the demand of that good will, for, will fall, which is your minimum all wage. All else being equal. <laughs> all, all else being equal. But I mean, it is your uh, minimum wage. Yeah. It is an application of your yeah. minimum wage. Yeah, that's right. We know this because we know that when we go to the market <laughs> and suddenly the price of a good goes up and up and up, then we will switch to something else. We won't consume more of this good simply because the price has gone up. So that is a kind of, well, call it a priori, but I would say it is simply the result of our experience being human beings. I mean, if we live with you know, 20 human beings and I am more <coughs> skilled at anything that these 20 human beings do, Will I simply remain completely isolated and not interact with these other people, albeit I could do the job, any of these jobs, cook, sew, whatever, better than they do? No. I would say, well, I prefer cooking, and albeit I sew better than these people, I will not do the sewing. I will say, look, I'll cook for you, and you do the sewing for me. <laughs> Yeah, I think, I, think, I think you touched on a very important uh, point here, and, and I hope uh, maybe I, I did not make that quite uh, clear enough. But I, I, I agree with the first point you make. Is, uh, if we deal with the outside world, we, we deal with you know, a sort of uh, phenomena of the, of the, of the uh, reality of the natural world around us. Again, so the way we can derive any laws there is an intellectual process on our part. You know, we need to interpret what goes on there. Mm. And the only way we can do that, because we, we cannot know and we can never really fully perceive of any kind of ultimate drivers behind this, as, you know, why is there gravity? You know, but, but, but what we can see is a certain pattern and regularities. And only because, only because we are fortunate enough that this reality around us does behave in a regular fashion, we can observe these regularities and, and then derive laws and principles from them. It's fundamentally different when we deal with the area of human action, because we are human beings ourselves, and therefore we can uh, um, uh, look at uh, human affairs, uh, human action, we can understand from within. Natural sciences we only can understand or try to understand from without. We, with human action, we do know the ultimate driver. We do know the purpose behind it because we understand human beings acting purposeful. We do know why people use money. 
what people do when they are laborers and receive a wage. You know, we, we, these are, are social concepts, creations of the human mind, and therefore we understand it. And Mises even goes, I think, probably a step further by saying the process of deriving at theories is sort of obviously a mental process, but it's actually one side of the coin of action. So action and analyzing action is, 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 is almost like, it's almost like the, sa the same thing. So therefore, uh, 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 making human action intelligible, we can only do that because we are actors ourselves, we are human actors ourselves. And, and, and therefore, that, that process, that mental process and deriving regularities is entirely different from the natural sciences. Mm -hmm. So I think once you've seen it that way, and, and at least I found Mises, when you read his epistemological work, entirely convincing, you would find it even strange for people to try to use the method of the natural sciences, you know, like Steele suggests, regression analysis, statistical features, to, to somehow press human valuation and action into these regular patterns. You know, these tools, these tools of the natural sciences, they are only so powerful because we deal with fairly stable relationships that we can uh, express with the phrases of physics and mathematics. They're reasonably stable, and that, that is fairly impressive for us. The human world is different, and, and, and so, so we can only make sense of it by applying, looking at it from within as human beings ourselves, and that requires us to use the a priori method, where we start with a purpose and then de derive regularities from there. Sorry, I will not uh, no, answer no, your no, question. No, no, I, uh, I, I don't disagree. Yeah, I don't disagree. Um, I, well, if I'm allowed to carry on and ask a different question to the one I had in mind. Yeah, you can uh, see what you have after this, these chap well, you think I've forgotten you. You're next in the queue. No, no, no I think no matter. Okay. It's, you were in the queue, it though. It seems to me that the big picture here is that we're all trying to make sense. Of oh, Bob. Okay. We're all trying to, trying, to, trying to work out how it works. Um, and this leads to some surprising kinds of claims. A good example would be in, in the argument about climate, in global warming specifically, to do with climate change, where there are a group of people who've come to the conclusion that, that global warming just has to be happening. But it, does, it appears not to be at the moment. It has been this famous pause in, in the rise in cessation. In the, well, whatever, pause anyway. We know that. We, we don't know it's cessation. We don't know that it won't resume. So, no. And they are convinced that it will. But in the meantime, they, they have to face the question, well, where's the heat gone? And their answer is, well, it's hiding in the sea. Um, and I detect some tittering and sniggering, and that's, I share that opinion. I, I agree with, with Bob Dine that this is wrong, but it illustrates another reason why people do something like a trial I think, which is in great complexity, um, or a situation of complexity where they think they've found something simple, which, which makes sense of it. In the case of the, the global warming people, it is that CO2 is a, a, a greenhouse gas, and there's an end of it. Therefore, ever, therefore, all other considerations are secondary. We libertarians do something very similar with the idea of freedom and consent, or whatever, however we describe it. We, we observe this immensely complicated world um, where apparently raising the minimum wage law doesn't seem to have the effects we expect, which is what Sam Bowman talked about. I think that other talk that was mentioned. But we cling fast to the, to the vision of a, of a world of total voluntaries. And that causes us to do exactly what <coughs> the global warming people do, which is to say, well, yes, they say that the, the heat has gone to high. We say the harm done by minimum wage rules is hiding. It's kind of there, but you can't see it. Um, uh, what, I, what I'm getting at is that, is that a priori thinking comes in many different forms. I mean, another one is evolution. Try getting a, an evolutionary scientist to concede that it's even ima imaginable that evolution might not be happening. Forget it. He's not going to do that. Um, likewise, the believers in intelligent design. There's no evidence that's going to change their mind. I actually cannot imagine any evidence that would cause me to believe in God. My disbelief in God is a priori. I can't imagine any evidence that would make me believe in God. I'll say it that strongly. This is, this is it's quite a widespread way of thinking. Um, 
I don't think I have a question. I think I was just making yeah. Yeah. Just to go inside yeah. is the fact that the God doesn't exist. I mean, that's what helped me out with that before. <laughs> it's, uh, uh, Bob? I think flogging this dead horse. Um, we'll go back to the minimum wage. <laughs> Having should have been... Exp- I was up to a meeting the other night, and it was tough. But the point it should be expressed thus way. When, by law, if someone's employed, they must be employed about a certain way. It is not the wage paid. The wage paid is not the only thing that changes. That's it. We can then say it might be a growth increase in unemployment. It might be people are required <coughs> to work in shittier conditions. We shout out more often, not to get the restroom or washroom painted as often as it used to be. One way or the other, they are going to be worth that way. And it may be they're going to be replaced by other people who are slightly more intelligent before they go to university. Uh, there are all sorts of things that are going to happen. But we can certainly say that something is going to change. Unless since there was inflation going at precise to the rate of such as blah, blah, blah. That's the only way out. But we can certainly say that. We don't have to say, oh, it's, it's hidden unemployment. It's a different kind of employment. Other different people, different conditions, different work rate, blah, blah. You can work it out. <coughs> well, the only, the one million unemployed, of course, are not it? We've had one million unemployed in this country since 1970. They're not even. That's just a, you know, There's yeah. empirical evidence now. Right? <laughs> 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 it's not the same, is it? Is anyone else? Any more questions? Well, let me do that. I'll uh, thank our speaker very much indeed. <laughs> <laughs> I think you've given us a marvellous time.